I don't know about you, but these days it's hard sometimes to remember what day of the week it is or even what season. I totally missed Mardi Gras and I guess Ash Wednesday this week. Mardi Gras and Lent are both rich traditions with a lot to offer. But as we enter this month focusing on balance in our worship services, Mardi Gras and Lent seem somehow to embody two extremes of life. Rather than swinging from one to the other, even in a regular rhythm, today I want to talk about finding contentment in a more moderate approach. In this largely Christian country, even we as Unitarian Universalists know the origin stories of Jesus. But he's not the only religious figure with a captivating story of his beginnings. Most religious figures have rich stories about their birth and their early years. The Buddha is no different. Much like the story of Jesus, Buddha's birth was accompanied by a foretelling and dreams and small miracles and the cooperation of majestic animals. In his case, it was elephants that were there to witness. All these stories point to a very special person being born, but the story of the Buddha's journey to enlightenment isn't just about him. The story is a parable a teaching story about how we're all invited on a journey of the middle path. This is one of the most compelling things about Buddhism to me. The tradition maintains that each and every person has the capacity to reach enlightenment. Siddhartha wasn't the one and only for all time. He was just a person who figured things out and shared what he found with others. In fact, some Buddhist traditions recognize a whole assortment of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Prince Siddhartha, whose story we heard, just happens to be the most recent Buddha. Who knows? You could be the next. It's very unlikely, but it's possible. <laughs> The story of Siddhartha leaving the palace and seeking enlightenment, first with the ascetics, is a great illustration of finding the middle way. Somewhere between the blind indulgence of palace life and the body-crushing asceticism of the monks, there is a middle way. Clinging too tightly to pleasure or suffering gets us stuck in life. Holding on too tightly, even to pleasure, ultimately leads to ignorance and suffering. The path that we're called to is a middle path. Reverend Christopher Bruce likens the middle way to bowling. Obviously, the goal is to get your ball down the middle of the lane. And it's strangely much harder than it looks. I often look jealously at the kids bowling whenever I go. They have those wonderful inflatable bumpers. Everybody wins. Unfortunately, the path to enlightenment doesn't come with quite so much assistance. It's up to each of us to find the middle way, not too close to one extreme or the other. And we can get wound up in knots, focusing on not getting too close to either side. But Reverend Christopher Boyce says that a more skillful approach than that sort of wandering comes from first centering ourselves, finding balance in ourselves before we release the ball on its journey. I myself am a terrible bowler and therefore have never been fond of the sport, but I'm learning this week that maybe I've been doing it all wrong. In Buddhism, of course, the middle way isn't limited to striking a balance between indulgence or asceticism. It's a concept that's brought to nearly every aspect of life. You may be familiar with the religious symbol of a big wheel with eight spokes. It shows up in interfaith 
recognitions where there are a lot of different religious symbols on display. To me, I always glance at it and think that it looks like a steering wheel from a ship, and I think, what's that doing up there? And I remember this eight-spoked wheel is the Buddhist wheel of life. Those eight spokes represent the eightfold path, or different areas of life that the Buddha taught about. I want to quickly name them so you get an idea of what we're talking about. The path includes right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. The Buddha gave basically an entire framework for living a life that moves toward liberation. In some ways, similar to Unitarian Universalism, it's more about a way of living than maintaining specific beliefs. The Eightfold Path also points to how seeking balance shows up in different ways. Right speech, for example, is a very narrow path. Right speech finds a balance between blabbering on and withholding information or withholding your heart from others. Right speech adheres to truth, but does so in a way that's compassionate and seeks relationship. It's a very balanced middle path that's required. I find right effort is another interesting challenge. To achieve our goals, whatever they are, the most effective method is a pretty moderate, steady effort. We all know that crash diets don't work. We know that working too hard in your professional life is a recipe for burnout. Those who have practiced yoga have likely sought the sweet spot of right effort in your practice. Holding everything too tightly will literally throw you way off balance and could lead to injury. Still, there has to be enough tension and support there to hold the pose, to make the progress, to grow in the career steadily, slowly. Right effort is a balance that we have all sought at some time or another. We Unitarian Universalists aren't inclined to dictate a particular spiritual path. We're even less inclined to follow the dictate of a particular spiritual path. So chart your own paths. See what works. As you do, I gently suggest that balance and a middle way will get you much farther in the long run. Now, contentment and balance isn't just in the actions that we take. At least as often, probably more often, contentment and balance depend on the attitude that we take in life, particularly to challenges. The Reverend Doug Kraft talks about a particular unpleasant experience on a flight to talk about finding contentment in the present moment. After a first flight was delayed, he barely made his connection. He had hoped to grab a bite to eat at the airport, but rushed to catch the second flight. Shortly after the plane pushed back from the jetway came the moment we have all experienced. The captain comes over the intercom. We want to give you an update on our progress. Everyone knows that's bad news. Like many people, Kraft liked looking out the window to see what was going on on the ground around him, but the woman seated there had closed the window so she could watch the movie. The other person in the row had very clearly been drinking and laughed very loudly to that same movie that she was watching. He wasn't into the movie. He tried to read, he tried to sleep, he tried to work on his computer, seeking the sweet sense of distraction that his fellow travelers seemed to be enjoying. Finally, he gave in. He closed his eyes and felt cranky. 
and relaxed. That's when he realized this crankiness did not consume him. It was not the overwhelming monster he had feared. It was much more like a cantankerous child complaining that they didn't get the right number of chicken nuggets or have the right colored cup to drink from. It was sad, but also a little endearing. That's when he remembered resistance is futile, as he put it. Life always has its frustrations and some suffering involved. You can fight as hard as you want to, but you cannot eliminate that reality. Doug Kraft says, life has its unavoidable discomforts, but it doesn't turn into anguish unless we have the hubris to think it should be different just because we want it to be different. For us Californians, a good metaphor for confronting the experience of the present moment may be negotiating a wave that breaks on the beach. You've probably been there. If you try running from it, it's probably going to catch you from behind, maybe knock you flat, it may even drag you out. The best strategy for confronting a wave is to dive into it head on. The best way to deal with discomfort is getting to know it. Eventually, both will pass us by. It is, of course, easier said than done. It's something we have to learn over and over until relaxing into the wave becomes habit and we learn to trust our own strength to get through it. The other piece of this balance is to let the wave pass on by when it's time. The purpose of acknowledging our feelings isn't to stew in them. The purpose is to set us free from the grasping. The verbs acknowledge and notice are very specific that way. I notice and acknowledge a sadness. It's something there, something that exists, but something that is not my whole being. I notice sadness. It's there. I am here. It's there and it will change and it will pass and I will let it. People often talk these days about the lessons learned over the course of the COVID pandemic. For me, one of those lessons came in a very early conversation with a tapestry member. This was in the early days when we were all figuring out how to deal with lockdown. In our new caged reality, some of us were getting stir crazy. And in a conversation, this tapestry member explained how he enjoyed going to the grocery store. You heard that right. He enjoyed going to the grocery store as an outing, looking around curiously, seeing what was there, being among people. Even if it's just to buy one or two things, he found pleasure in these little adventures. As this conversation continued, or it may even have been a different conversation with the same person, I learned that this person had done something I find incredibly impressive. From some unusual business success, he was able to retire early, and in the midst of retirement, cultivated a sense of contentment. He dismisses the accomplishment as just part of his personality, how he's wired. And that may have something to do with it. But I want to suggest to you that finding contentment is one of the biggest accomplishments we can aim for in life. How often do you hear a young person say, when I grow up, I want to be content? <laughs> Some want to change the world, some want money, some may want a particular career. The nobler among them may speak of 
finding love with spouses or children. Rarely, if ever, have I heard, I want to be content. Someone should let them know that the goal is a little bit less concrete. As we talk about balance all this month and contentment in particular this week, a little disclaimer is in order. Balance doesn't always mean taking the middle between two extremes. There is no middle ground to be struck with bigotry. There is no middle path between a tyrant and people seeking freedom. Today's message about embracing contentment is not an invitation to become passive or content with Putin's invasion of Ukraine. As Dr. King so aptly put, there are some certain things in our nation and in the world about which I am proud to be maladjusted and which I hope all people of goodwill will be maladjusted. Being content doesn't mean not caring. It doesn't mean being inactive or not curious about the world. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. Those elusive goals, contentment and balance, require a pretty profound grounding and connection with our center point. Perhaps the center point is a breath for you. Perhaps it's a deep appreciation for the goodness of creation. Perhaps your center point is God or the flourishing of human spirit. Whatever that point is for you, in these troubled times, let it be a point of balance. I want to close this invitation to find contentment with a prayer from Reverend Rebecca Parker. She writes, There is a love holding us. There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all. We rest in that love. Amen.